I'm John Hemmerger, Jr., Vice President of the Geologist Jack Cole. And I'd like to welcome you here this evening. Um, hopefully, you will have uh, maybe had a chance to peruse the slides that are passing by. I'm not going to say all that stuff, but uh, there's a good upcoming program. We'll maybe mention that at the end. Uh, that one will come up uh, in a minute or two, or uh, 15, 20 seconds, something like that. But um, the uh, geologists of Jackson Hole uh, really <coughs> appreciate the opportunity to partner with the Teton County Library and Library Foundation to use this facility and bring this uh, ongoing program to you. So I just wanted to call your attention to uh, the library and the library foundation without whom we would not be able to do this, this program. Um, there is a benefit to membership. This is the students' evening programs are free and open to the public. But um, uh, there's the next two upcoming programs. Uh, Laura Vietti from the University of Wyoming is going to talk. That's going to be a very good talk, by the way. Um, and then there is a member's talk on the Wednesday after that uh, about the severe weather forecasting that Jack Hales is going to, to give the members. We meet monthly up at the museum. So uh, field trips, we may actually have a field trip this winter. Mike and I are thinking about something. But uh, field trips are something also that, are, that we do for members. And so between uh, members, uh, field trips, members uh, once a month uh, program out the library, you might want to consider consider membership in the Geologist of Jackson Hole. You certainly don't need to be a geologist. If you're interested in the greater world about you, then uh, you would be more than qualified to become a member. A um, couple of things. Uh, there are some membership application forms out there. There is a copy of the almost finished now 2015 program calendar, so you can take a look at that. And there's a summary of the, the last program that's out there. And then we have just released the 2016 program calendar as well. There are copies of that out on the table. There will, this will be on our website shortly if it's not already. Um, so you can see uh, there's a lot of good stuff coming next year, starting on January 12th and going on through November next year. So uh, beyond that, uh, we have something very interesting here for you this evening. Neighbor state, Utah. Uh, there's really a lot of good stuff there. We've got somebody who's more than qualified to, uh, to tell us, talk to us about it. And I'm going to turn this over now, the floor over to Mike Schur, who's going to inter introduce our speaker for this evening. Mike? Thank you, John. Uh, every rock has a story to tell, and uh, tonight's speaker is someone who can tell you that story. Rick Darwinkle got his start in rock and mineral collecting as a sixth grader doing a science fair project, which took him to a rock shop in Salt Lake on Redmond Road. The science fair project turned into a hobby, a passion, uh, as a fellow sufferer, perhaps an obsession, and, uh, and also a lifetime of study, including the University of Utah, Montana School of Mines, Rick eventually came back to that same rock store to work and eventually purchased the store. And today, he and his family run Rock Pit Legends in Salt Lake, which I had the pleasure of visiting last November. It was absolutely wonderful. Lucky for you, Rick brought the store to you. And uh, <laughs> please join me in welcoming Rick. I did bring some specimens. These are out of my own collection. These are most. Oops. I wish oh. I could talk loud enough without it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these are specimens that we have in our store on display in our little museum, which is just a little room. The first room you come into in our store, uh, these are on display. At least most of these. Some of these are not on display there. I keep them uh, tucked away. But uh, so. First of all, I brought postcards up here. Uh, they're free to take. Please take the postcards. Second of all, please don't touch the specimens. Some of these specimens are easily handed, handled without damage, and then some of them are so fragile that just touching would destroy them. And some of the smallest ones up here are some of the most valuable ones I own. So I know it's bizarre when you buy 
a micro specimen and you can't see it without a 100 power microscope and it costs a thousand dollars but <laughs> you know my wife thinks I'm crazy <laughs> so, so, um, I, I thought about going over all the mining history as it pertains to the numbers but then I thought that's really boring you know, who wants to hear it? 1864, this mine produced so many ounces of gold, so many ounces of silver, and this shaft produced whatever. So I, I, I've changed it a little bit. Uh, I've given that talk before uh, that people like to hear, but tonight, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, specific areas and, and some of the stories that go along with some of the mining districts in Utah. I'm going to start out with a, a, the, the saddest part of the, the evening is the uh, mine disasters. So the worst mining disaster in Utah was in Schofield. It was in 1900. Um, there were, it was a coal mine, and the coal mine dust, the, the coal dust had built up in the mine, and the methane and everything else had built up in there, and there was an explosion of that, uh, and then that set off the powder magazine, which produced all the gases that go along with that, and within minutes, 200 miners had died. They died so fast, some of them were found clenching their tools. Uh, one guy was reported to still be leaning against the wall with a cigarette in his mouth. I don't know why he was smoking a cigarette at a coal mine. Um, <laughs> haven't figured that one out yet, but uh, he was still leaning on a shovel when they found him. And that's how fast these guys died. Um, it took a month to, to recover all the bodies and ship them all back all over the state to where they, these people had come from. Almost all of them were immigrants, many of them were Finns. Uh, there was also uh, some uh, Japanese as well. And then uh, some of you may remember a few years ago the candle, Crandall Canyon coal mine that collapsed and killed, I think, about 13 miners then. That was the latest. Uh, I'm sure there are many other miners out there that have died. The, uh, the first report of the mine, miners dying was the, uh, the Schofield coal mine accident. Most certainly, because that was in 1900, mining started in Utah in the 1860s, early 1860s. There had to have been other miners died, but there's no records of those. At least, not that I can find. So the Cam Crandall Canyon coal mine collapsed, uh, killing 13 miners. Uh, they spent a month trying to get to them, thinking they were still alive, but never could find anybody or, or even recover the bodies. The mine was eventually sealed as a tomb for them. So that's unfortunately a, a big part of my, any mining anywhere in the world is, is the disasters. Um, those disasters don't even come close to some of the things you hear about from China, Peru, Butte. Montana. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll move on to more pleasant topics now. Um, I keep getting asked about the Ozakarite. That's this big chunk of black wax up here. It's stinky. It's um, it's just natural wax. It's uh, when it was discovered in Utah, it was the only known place for it. And get you dirty real quick. <laughs> just so. Um, it was the only place that had ever been discovered. Now it's been discovered in about a half a dozen places around the world. It doesn't really have any commercial value today, but at the time, Edison used it to make the first recording cylinders because they were made out of wax. It has a low melting temperature, but yet it's pretty solid uh, when it's not uh, liquid. They, uh, it was also used uh, in Model Ts uh, to give the paint some uh, blackness. It's, it's uh, let's see. Well, it's uh, oh, they, they originally, or finally, when they quit mining it in, in the 60s and 70s, when plastics came about, they were mining it by injecting hot steam into the ground and melting it and then pumping it out right next to it. And if you look at this piece, you can see how it's been melted and, and just poured across the ground. People like to stop at the mine because it's, it's very accessible. It's right along the road going through a Soldier Summit, so if you drive from Price to a Spanish Fork, you go right past it, and uh, they because of these. They were mining with steam, they had a lot of coal there. So everybody always brings me coal. Oh, look, you want to buy my, coal, my Ozakarite? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to buy your coal either. So, um, But uh, it was used for, uh, let's see. Oh, so it was used in the records. It was used in uh, uh, tissues and toilet paper to make them so, uh, soft. It was uh, because it was used in the first tires too. There were vulcanized rubber tires. It was put in there to make them soft, so they absorb shock more. So you're welcome to pick this one up as you come by, but it is going to get you all black. <laughs> so you take a sniff as you go by. It's kind of fun. So another one that's uh, unique to Utah is or used to be unique to Utah is gilsonite. Gilsonite is a it used to be thought it was a, a type of coal. It was first 
noticed in the 1770s by the Spaniards that came through looking for gold. They tried to use this coal. It doesn't burn. <laughs> so, it looks like coal. It feels like coal. It doesn't burn. It melts. And if you go onto our website, I've done a YouTube video on there. There's a link on our website to it that shows I'm trying to burn it with a lighter. It, it just starts melting and dripping and oozing everywhere. So it, it wound up being a very unique product from Utah. Uh, it was used in Henry Ford's Model T's as the lacquer. The old, if you can get a, a Model T in any color as long as it's black. <laughs> this was the black. <laughs> so they put six coats of this on there uh, to give it a black, that black shiny uh, look. Uh, so it, it, it's after the Model T's, it was used for, um, because it doesn't react with any acids or even strong bases. It's not sol dissolvable or soluble. So it was used for uh, lining uh, pipes that had acids going through them or storage tanks that needed to be acid uh, resistant. It, uh, it's still used today. They still mine it. And it's used today in uh, ink cartridges. So when you get your ink cartridge, this is the black that comes in your ink cartridge. <laughs> so it's very interesting, yes. So uh, Gilsonite, uh, gets his name from a man named Gilson. He uh, was a very prominent man in Utah in his day in the late 1800s. Uh, he, uh, he was a, a marshal, uh, he did all kinds of weird things, but uh, he, um, he finally hired some chemists to figure out what this could be used for, and that's when it really took off. They found it was resistant to use for mining tankers, uh, pipes, uh, Budweiser used it for lining the inside of their beer casks because it isn't resistant. I mean, it is resistant to everything, and so it was a good thing like that. And they found that if they used it too long, then it kind of tainted the flavor of the beer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was used for a long for a while, but uh, not too long. So, um, the the mines out there uh, go on forever. There's a couple of mines where you can see. There are open trenches on the surface, and, and the biggest ones are about 60 feet wide and about 100 feet deep. And if you get on top of a hilltop, you can see they run for miles in both directions, and they're straight as can be. So th there's a lot of uh, debate about how this formed. There's a lot of sediment sitting on top of the main deposit, but it was probably some type of coal deposit, uh, that, or, or at least some type of bog marsh, lignite type stuff that's pushed up and then filtered and altered naturally, chemically through the ground until it formed what it is today. There's many places you can go out there and walk the ground and find little one-inch seams that just run for miles. They're, they're really kind of cool. You know, people go out there and pick at them. They think they're going to campfire, you know, build a campfire with them. It's just not going to work. So, so a couple of the other big mining districts in Utah is the Bingham Mine. I, I understand some of you guys went down there this last, or a couple of years ago, down to the big, big copper mine down in Bingham. Um, so you probably know a lot of the history of that one already. It's the largest hole, man-made hole on Earth. It's visible from space. You always hear those kinds of things. Um, it's not visible from space. It's not the largest. It's not the largest. What's the largest? Uh, the Chukikimata Mine. It depends on how you measure. Chukikimata is the longest mine by far. But it's not the biggest hole. No, I was told that there are five holes, mm -hmm. and they are lining up the lips between. Them. Right, they are. They are, and and eventually Chukikimata will be significantly larger than Bingham. Your information. <laughs> I'm a professor that did all of his work at Chukikimata, and oh wow, man, he beat everything into me. So um, yes, Chukikimata will be bigger. So will um, uh, the new big one down in. Uh, North of Bisbee, wherever that's at. Uh, it's not Bisbee, but it's the one, it's the new one north of Bisbee. I can't remember the name of it. But yeah, it'll be bigger than two. The copper deposits are bigger, but uh, the Kinnicott's no longer expanding out, they're going underground, so it's not going to get any bigger than the other ones are. So uh, the Bingham district, or the Bingham the copper mine started in 1864. So I should have started a little bit with the Mormons. Um, the Mormons came into Salt Lake. Uh, Brigham Young did not want the people out prospecting for, for riches of the earth. He wanted everybody to build houses and roads and temples and uh, farm. That was the big thing. They needed food. So he didn't want everybody out looking for gold. He wanted everybody uh, farming and, and building houses. So they didn't do a whole lot of it. But then when Johnson's army came into town, they started doing it. So they, they realized, okay, the Mormon resistance isn't that much of a resistance. <laughs> 
And so they, their soldiers started prospecting around and then they started spreading out. And uh, in 1864, they uh, developed Bingham Canyon, what the Bingham District, which is now Bingham Copper Mine, along with a lot of others, Merger, Gold Hill, and Park City, and, and all the ones up uh, big in Little Cottonwood Canyon. So they'd spread out and start all these districts. The Mormons didn't get involved until these districts were already established, and then they just started buying them from the soldiers. <laughs> so it worked out really good for them. They didn't have to do all the work, and they got all the, all the money. So uh, the Bingham District was originally uh, just a pasture field for uh, horses and cows until one guy up there found a seam of Galena, uh, Silver Lake and Galena at the surface, and he sent it back to Fort Douglas, the, the military fort there in Salt Lake, and they had it assayed and said, oh, this galena runs like 30% silver. So very rich. Um, not the richest in Utah, but uh, very rich. So they started uh, mining it and developing it. And you can look and, and see old pictures. You can see the mountain that they started on. That mountain that used to stand up is now the pit. So it's completely gone. Um, there was a number of little cities that cropped up. Shanty towns, not really cities, little towns. They cropped up the different canyons, and, and they, each each of these little little towns were for the different uh, ethnic groups. So you had the town for the Finns, the town for the Swedes, the town for the Germans, and, and for the Mexicans, and and all of them. And most of those were all gone. The only one that still exists is Copperton, which was for the executives. And uh, it's really a neat little tiny town to drive through. It's actually smaller than Jackson. I, I didn't notice how small Jackson was until I got here. <laughs> um, it's a town of about 4,000 people now, uh, and it's dwindling rapidly. But it was built for the executives, so the roofs and the rain gutters and, and everything's all copper. And a lot of the houses, you know, the, the, and all the houses, they're very nice and neat houses. They're, you know, 20s and 30s houses, so they're small brick houses, but they, you know, not too many places you can drive through and see a whole bunch of copper roofs in a little tiny town. So. But that's what they have there. Uh, Lark, you'll see some of these specimens from Bingham that are from the Lark mine and from the Ajax mine and, and a few of those other mines. All those mines were consumed the last time that the pit was expanded another rain. Uh, the Lark mine and some of these specimens would now be a thousand feet out and a thousand feet high <laughs> out there in that rain. So, uh, and so I feel very fortunate in order to be able to even have these specimens. Uh, but not a lot of them were saved back then. And they just didn't save these specimens. So. Anyway, so make note of those, uh, the Lark specimens, uh, they're, uh, that, that mine in, in town is completely gone. So. Uh, Bingham uh, wound up being a consolidation of about 100 different mines and prospects, and uh, it was all brought under control uh, by the Utah Copper Corporation. Uh, eventually it changed hands a number of different times. Uh, people know it as Anaconda, uh, the Utah Smelter, number of different mine names, and, and now it's the Kennecott Copper Corporation. I think it's still owned, it's owned by Rio Tinto now. Um, so, um, and they're the ones that just uh, furnished the, or uh, finished the big museum down there in Salt Lake, the, uh, the Natural History Museum for the University of Utah. The building was $45 million and it has a huge copper roof. <laughs> so, I think that had to be half of it. <laughs> so, um, if you have questions, by all means, ask questions. I will always love questions or comments. So Park City started about the same time as Bingham. Uh, Park City mines were uh, deep and big. Uh, some of them go down 2,500 feet. Uh, all underground workings. There's one ore body that was about 1,500 feet long and, and about 150 feet in diameter. And they mined it almost exclusively from the bottom up. So, uh, Stoke and Cap Mining. So they, they did that. They took that out. Uh, that was the Ontario. Uh, in 1920, the uh, copper mines or the silver mines in Park City were producing about $20,000 of revenue a week, and 14000 of that was coming just from the Ontario. Mm -hmm. So it, it was the biggest mine, and, and they had the Argentiferous Galena, uh, meaning Galena with a lot of silver in it. And uh, their, their silver ran as much as 60% silver in the Galena. So uh, I, that part of the point, I don't know, is it really still Galena? <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me it should be called silver with Galena. But, uh, uh, so they, they had a lot of Galena with silver in it. They had um, a lot of other great specimens. Pyrite crystals littered the dump up to a foot across. So big cubes 
of pyrite and littered the dump. Those are all gone now. There's houses on top of all those dumps. And I can't find anybody who has one of those crystals. <laughs> the U has a couple of semi-okay ones tucked away. But they don't even have them on display. But uh, you see pictures. You see pictures of people holding you know, a 100-pound single pyrite crystal. But none of them were saved, unfortunately. So Bingham was also famous for its, uh, its gold. It had gold, silver, zinc, and copper, a little bit of copper. Uh, had zinc in the form of sphalerite, and so they, they got a lot of sphalerite out of there, so there was a lot of zinc, uh, oh, lead, and, uh, and the copper and the silver, some gold. Gold was uh, the big money maker, even though it was the silver that they got the most of. So gold's always the, the, the king of the show, though, isn't it? All right, so uh, Merker. Merker is another mine in Utah that uh, started out as a gold mine uh, in the late 1880s. It had gold, it had a lot of gold, but it was flower gold, and there was no technology to get it out. People kept saying, oh, we'll try this. They built build, build, big, build big mills there and then try and, and get this, gold, this flower gold out of the, the, the solid rock. It was in a clay rock, and some of it was in an opalite that uh, had mercury in it, uh, cinnabar. And so they tried over and over and over again. Nothing ever worked. It wasn't until uh, in the 1900s, early, early 1900s, that uh, a guy from Australia came over and said, hey, look, we have this technology. We use it over in Australia. And so it worked. And so they mined gold, but it, they couldn't get enough of it out. There was just no way to pulverize the rock small enough and, and be able to leach the, the gold out of it. So, that gave up. Uh, they gave up on that project, and a guy from back east, uh, a couple of brothers that were uh, farmers from uh, back east, came out and he said, "We don't care about the gold. We want the mercury. It's where all the money is." So they mined mercury out of there in the form of cinnabar, and it was in an opalite. And so every once in a while, you'll see a piece of uh, this white white opalite with the bands and streaks of cinnabar, which are bright pink, going through it, used in jewelry. And uh, I couldn't find any to bring today, but. Uh, it's hard to come by. When I was a kid, and I first went to this rock shop that I own now, the, the owner had piles of this cinnabar just outside, and uh, I bought chunks of it from him. You know, it was a dollar here, a dollar there. It was really cool, and now I can't find any. So, um, but uh, if you read the old miners' reports and their old diaries, when they got deep underground uh, looking for this stuff, it's, uh, under 1,000 feet deep, uh, 800 feet deep, they talk about coming into caverns of liquid mercury in there that they would wade through that were waist deep. <laughs> yeah, and they would pump all that stuff out, bottle it up, and ship it to all the gold miners who used it for amalgamating the gold. I don't know how easy it would be to wade through the waist deep pile of mercury. I can't even imagine moving. <laughs> you can almost walk on it, I don't think. But, uh, anyway, waist deep puddles of mercury. Uh, I wouldn't want to be walking through waist deep puddles of mercury. But uh, so they, they mined that out, and then um, in the 70s, Barrick bought it, and they didn't care about the mercury. They wanted the gold. They had the technology to remove the gold, and they mined it for about 15 years, got all the gold out, and part of their deal with the state was that they had to return the land back to its original contour. It's been mined for over 100 years. <laughs> What's the original contour? <laughs> so, so they just made something up. And uh, so now you, you can drive up the road most of the way, and then you can hike up and see. You can't see anything. There's nothing to see. There's just trees growing on it, and bushes and, and ground. They seeded it like five times before they found anything that would grow on it. And uh, But it's just basically kind of a scar on the ground. But it's a nice looking scar. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? No? Comments? Yes? Uh, the bigger mines in the open, right? Yes. There's other ranges further west. Do they have a bit mined? Or Nothing like what's in the ochres. The ochres, the, the Bingham Pit is a Carlin type deposit, meaning the hot solution came up into the rock, altered the rock, and deposited the ores. The other ones are part of the Basin and Range province, and so they have a different kind of uh, deposit. You get the, the basin range type deposits, which are just on faults right on the front and back of each mountain range. And so the, the next range over, which I don't even know how to say the name of that range, it, it's another Indian name, but uh, it has nothing on it. There was a Tempe district where they mined a, a small amount of mercury, and they tried to start a few copper mines, but nothing, nothing that was ever commercial. 
Now the range to the south of it is significant. That's where Mercury and Ophir are, and they have uh, a lot of copper, silver, mercury. In fact, most people consider it all one district, even though it is two distinct mountain ranges. I was just out there collecting last weekend. All right, any other questions? No? All right, so uh, Tintic is the next big district that's out there. And Tintic District is between the Ogres and the next mountain range to the south. And it's right on the Utah, I'm sorry, the Tooele County and the Juad County line. In fact, the, the county line goes right down the main street of Tintic, uh, of Eureka. And so uh, Eureka is, depending on which side of the, the road you're on, you, if your line spans them, you're paying taxes in two different counties. So, <laughs> It's a point of contention with the mine owners. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, uh, but the, the Eureka, it, it was uh, very, very famous for its silver. And the silver was uh, in the form of native silver. There was also gold. There's some gold, silver, and uh, uh, tellurium minerals up here that you can see. Uh, visible gold. The Centennial Eureka mine was the biggest one. At the time, it was such a rich mine that they, they couldn't get big enough timbers to build their, their head frame. So they sent to Sweden for timbers. The timbers were 125 feet long. They had to be brought in in rail. And at the time, it was the largest timbers ever used in North America. And they got into the mine on the rail, and they couldn't figure out how to get them up to the mine. <laughs> it was uphill. They, they had no way. They couldn't get their oxen and pull them up there. It, it was just way too heavy. So they had to wait until winter, and then they built an ice sled uh, down to them and pulled them up with the hoist. And then it took months to get them standing up and in place. So they're still there today. You can still drive out there and see them. They're huge. They're about 75 feet above ground and, and go down to the ground with the rest. So it's, it's pretty significant. They're, they're huge. Uh, they're like, you go to head frames nowadays, you see them, they're two feet across. Even they're like four feet across. <laughs> so these trees were just massive. Um, there's a, a, a section that you drive through as you're going uh, from uh, west to east, or uh, east to west. Uh, just before you get to the town of Eureka, you can see all these mines on the left-hand side of the road, on the south side, and they're huge. Uh, some of these mines are huge, and, and they're getting ready to open a couple of them. Uh, these ones were mined from the late 1870s, 1880s, uh, up until some of them were still going in, in the 60s. They were producing massive amounts of silver, and, and they called this area Millionaire's Row. And uh, there's about a dozen mines there. The reason they called it Millionaire's Row is because miners would show up with five dollars. They would rent a shovel for a dollar, rent a pig for a dollar, they'd get a meal, and they'd go out there and work. And within a week, they had a million dollars worth of silver. And it wasn't just one miner. There was dozens of miners that found that they could do this. And so some of them uh, took their fortunes and, and left. Some of them sold their mines. Some of them worked them until they died. Died very, very wealthy and still living in a cabin out in the mountains. Um, the Fitch family, uh, Mr. Fitch, uh, he, he was kind of an honorary, cranky, cross old guy. Uh, at least that's his reputation. He died in the 50s, I think. But uh, when Brigham Young University was on the verge of collapse financially, he stepped in and paid off all their debts. Just paid off everything. Built new buildings, paid students tuitions, everything. Millions and millions and millions of dollars worth. Uh, so. I, I don't know if he was trying to buy blessings in heaven or show off his wealth, but <laughs> either way, uh, it, it wound up being a good thing for a lot of people because a lot, of, a lot of students were able to still go to school because of that. When he died, he, his wife had already died, he died, and he was buried. And if you go out to his grave, which is a personal family grave, it's uh, not as big as this room, and there's about 15 people buried there, most of them there's no records of. Nobody knows who they are, where they came from, anything about them. And next to him and his wife are buried two infant graves. They never had kids. So, so that just adds to the fuel, you know, the speculation. What's in those graves? <laughs> so, but it's a very hard grave to, uh, graveyard to find. It's, it's, it took me years to figure out where it was and a lot of clues. But uh, anyway, very interesting. So uh, the Fitch family uh, really pulled through for BYU. He died. Um, nobody knows how big his estate was, but his kids and grandkids inherited it, and they all moved back east. So. Uh, legitimate kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> it was 
Yeah. But they have the legitimate kids. <coughs> yes, I, I guess I should have made that point earlier. All right, is there any other questions? All right, so I'm going to leave time for everybody to come up and look at the specimens, ask questions about the specimens. Ask, again, please don't touch. Like I said, some of them are extremely fragile. Yes? Where do you go golden today? Um, Montana, Alaska. <laughs> There's, there is gold in Utah, but most of it's flower gold. And uh, I, I, didn't have, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I guess I don't know what flower gold is. Oh, it, it's gold. When you gold pan, it looks like flour in the bottom of your gold pan. It's super, super fine, super hard to get out. It's not very fun to collect. Where did you get the uranium? Um, we've already had this discussion. <laughs> There's some yellow cake uranium up here. I guess I could have talked about the uranium uh, yeah. mining. Uh, Utah is famous for its uranium. Uh, a lot of the mines in southern Utah were mined uh, way back for Madame Curie. Her, a lot of her samples were sent, uh, she got from southern Utah. Mm -hmm. We have huge uranium mines. Uh, some of them go on 12, 15 miles of tunnels underground in one mine, uh, one straight at it. Uh, and there's many layers of them. They're all down in the Four Corners area. The whole Four Corners area is full of uranium. You, a lot of the mines were very rich in Utah. And so some of these uh, specimens here are uh, different uranium minerals from here. No, none of them are radioactive enough to be dangerous or toxic. The yellow cake over there is not even detectable with a Geiger counter at about two feet. So nothing to worry about. And yes, I got them from a friend. Any other questions? All right, then I'll invite everybody to come up. Oh, yeah. Well, I know down west of Cedar City, they mine a lot of iron. Yes. And you know any stories about that? Um, yeah, I've been down there collecting a number of times. Um, you always have to deal with the polygamists when you go down there, so yeah. I don't go down there too often. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it can be interesting. But uh, yeah, so some of the large iron mines down there, uh, it's very concentrated iron in the form of hematite and magnetite. Uh, most of that was shipped to Geneva, uh, the Geneva Processing Center there on, on Utah Lake. Uh, there are specimens, collectible specimens from down there, but not a lot. There's some apatite occasionally, a lot of uh, martite crystals, which is hematite pseudomorphing to magnetite, or magnetite pseudomorphing to hematite. So, but uh, most of it's just chunks of iron, and iron ore, uh, hematite. Yeah. Nothing very exciting. <laughs> Alabaster. Alabaster also is from down in Cedar City area, St. George area. There's a lot of that. Uh, there's one family, and I can't think of their name. They own most of the mines down there for it. They mine it for carving, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, comes in about 10 different colors. Chocolate. Place you can go to, find it. to find it yourself. Um, there are places you can go find alabaster. Uh, being an arid environment, it formed in a lot of different areas down out in Utah. The good carving stuff, the color, no. I, I don't know of any places you can go find it. Uh, a lot of the names are like um, uh, magnetite or you know, ends in height. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it named after the place where it's found rather than... So I mean, naming minerals is, is, is kind of tricky. So uh, most of the time the person who describes it as a new mineral gets to name it. Uh, so sometimes they're named from their location. Um, we have one mineral specimen up here. It's called Eureka Dumpite. It was found on a dump in Eureka. <laughs> it's been named the worst mineral name of all, <laughs> of all 5,000 mineral species. Um, and so, so that's the name from where it's from. Uh, some of the names, we don't know where they came from. The, the word gold, we don't know where that, that originated from. We have no idea. Same as silver, although we, we give it a different name nowadays. And, you know, a Latin name, and so it's much easier. Some are named after people. Um, there's a piece over here named her, uh, Abernathyite uh, that's named after Dr. Abernathy, uh, who was a, a mineralogist. Uh, Smithsonite, named after David Smithson, yeah, uh, the same as the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and sometimes they, they take words and put them together. Uh, Yamohoite is a combination of uranium, molybdenum, ox uh, oxide. So, Yamoho. I don't know, I would have never done that, but. <laughs> So, um, and then sometimes they're named after their chemical compositions. Uh, so like malachite is pretty, you know, it's widespread, it's not just from one spot. Right? No, malachite is a very common copper yeah. ore. Mm -hmm. so, so how, um, uh, is, it started out 
getting the name just in one place, and then uh, why were the other places made the same Malachi rather than Cain? Well, Malachi, okay, so Malachi's a mineral species, yeah. and so you know, just for simplicity, Malachi's going to be the same everywhere, just like water is the same everywhere. We don't, we don't call it something different. Yeah, exactly. So, I have a sense there's a story that Malachi Yes, so. Yep, this is uh, beryllium ore from here in Utah. Not from here in Utah, from down in Utah. And uh, beryllium, see, to me, this is worth way more than the ore. There's <laughs> like a dime's worth of ore there, and this is the $4,000 geo. And so, um, but this is what they mine for beryllium. They crush this up and, and extract the beryllium out of it. Beryllium has some neat properties. I know there's some chemists in here. <laughs> so beryllium is, it can be alloyed with copper and it becomes very strong. Uh, the beryllium becomes very, makes the copper very strong so they can use it as a non-sparking hammer and that's what this is. This is a beryllium a copper hammer used in the oil and gas industry because it doesn't spark. <laughs> so very important for that. It's also used, uh, beryllium is used to make uh, disc brakes for the uh, brake of jumbo jets. It's, uh, it's very interesting. You can take a torch to it and make it glowing red hot and turn the torch off and by that time it's cool enough to pick up. It does not transfer heat. Um, it's uh, 10 times stronger than steel, but only weighs 1 16th of steel. So it has a lot, it's used in uh, the nose cones, uh, the, the gyros in uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. because It's extremely light and strong. The warheads, yeah, it's used in all kinds of things, military wise. Doesn't absorb heat, doesn't absorb cold, and it's strong, super strong. Yes. So there's obviously museums with minerals here. Which are the rarest and most valuable for make sure they seem for the uh, rarest, uh, there's uh, some specimens right here in these little black boxes. I put some hand lenses here. You can look at them, just don't open them. There's four of them here. These were brand new mineral species. They were just announced a month or two ago as being brand new mineral species. Uh, a couple of those, there's only a couple of known samples. Of, um, there's one in the museum. I have the other one. Uh, a couple of them, one, the guy that discovered them has got a few of them. But, uh, and, Let's see, the type localities down here. Type locality means that's the first place the mineral was discovered. Uh, so there's, in Utah, there's about 85 type localities. I only have a handful of them out here. Um, some of them, there is only one known sample, and it's in a museum. It's tucked away in a drawer somewhere, and you'll ever see it again. Uh, Value-wise, it's really hard to say which ones are the most valuable. Uh, definitely not the Osaka, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, the red beryl and the brown case over here. And that's the Utah's famous for being the red beryl. The red, a red beryl is the same thing as an emerald, a green emerald, except it's, it's these raspberry pink red colors. It's the only place in the world that's found is here in Utah. Uh, gemstones of high quality go for 15,000 a carat, uh, significantly more than diamonds. So, and then down the end is some lapidary materials, things that uh, Utah's famous for cutting and polishing, gem type materials including an aquamarine, a sunstone, dinosaur bone, parasite, that kind of stuff. Go ahead. Are there any other questions? Are there any rare earth minerals in Utah? Um, there, the verisite, uh, the Clay Canyon verisite mine just sold. They're going to mine it for scandium. So they're going to crush up all the verisite for scandium. <laughs> it's a sacrifice. Yes, so um, I don't know of any other rare earth minerals that are mined there. I think. Beryllium's not a rare earth, but uh, yeah, the scandium, I guess, would be the only one. So, so you're in the field, you're applying all these, all you this know, mm -hmm. How do you know this is a, a new mineral? We can smell them. The other five thousand years ago. So. Um, yeah, no, so how these things are discovered is these guys that are very good at finding these will go out to a mine and just pull a backpack full of stuff. And they'll come home and sit in their house or in a lab and look at them with a scanning electron microprobe for months before they find something new. So, it's, it's a long, tedious process.
And that takes years to get them described as a new species. What are your favorite samples? Uh, all of these. <laughs> <laughs> I have nine kids. It's like asking me which one's my favorite kid. I am, by the way. Where is the beryllium mine at? It is west of Delta. Where, okay, where's yeah, Delta? Uh, Delta is uh, two and a half hours south of Salt Lake. Is there something unique about the geology there that the beryllium? Um, I don't know how the deposit wound up being there. Uh, it's very, the, the, the ore is very old. Um, the mountain ranges that sit around it are about 35 million years old, 33 to 35 million years old. They're all volcanic, and this is sedimentary, and, and so the, the volcanics are on top of it, uh, or around it, actually. But uh, I don't know the details of the, the beryllium mining. You know, they're, they're very close looked about that sort of stuff down there. Um, I tried to drive out there last fall, and uh, my friend and I were cruising down the dirt road. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And we're cruising down this dirt road, and all of a sudden, I saw a camera on the side of the road. And I'm like, there's no way. They're taking pictures. That's just got to be scare people. Within two minutes, there was a security truck on top of us. Oh. And I went, yeah, you need to turn around and go back. God dang it. <laughs> I wanted to take some pictures. And went, oh. <laughs> Not going to allow that. Wow. Was it a government? No, no, but it is a strategic metal. So. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, if there are any other questions? I would like to uh, to thank Rick and to do so. We we thought of giving him a rock or. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.